Somehow, I knew he had been weeping. Juniper was sitting on the only chair in the room, facing in the same direction as Cormac, and I knew she had not spoken. She was waiting. I looked around the room, which was simple and orderly. There was the hearth with the smoke hole in the roof, but it was obvious that the ashes were cold and dead, and that Cormac had not cooked there recently. Most of the light came through the door and through one opening on the same wall. The earth floor was covered with rushes and herbs that had a sweet smell. There was a wooden chest, one or two books, a shelf that, had, that held jars of beans, seeds, and nuts. There were some plates, a cup, and cooking pots, a crock that perhaps held bread. Neither Cormac nor Juniper moved or spoke, and having looked around the room, I crouched down on the floor, just inside the door, and wondered what to do next. The silence was thick, and within the silence I could feel Juniper waiting for something, though I could not imagine what. I sighed rather loudly, but Juniper did not turn my way nor show any sign of having heard me. It struck me that Cormac, at least seen from the back, did not look as bad as I had thought. Sitting there on his bed, quite still, not running away, he looked dignified. All at once I surprised myself with the sound of my own voice. I am sorry I threw a stone at you, I said. I expect I was frightened. There was another long silence. It was a silly thing to do, and I'm sorry you did not take the food. I did not realize it was for you. There was still silence in the room, though it felt a warmer silence. Juniper still waited. Cormac still faced the wall. I'll go outside now, I said. I don't blame you if you hate me. I went outside and again sat by the well, trying to think what had happened. I had been so sure that I was right to hate Cormac. Hadn't Philan said that it wouldn't have happened to him if he had not led a wicked life, and that wicked people ought to be punished? After a few minutes, I could hear voices softly talking inside. I even thought I heard Juniper laugh very gently. The voices rose and fell for a bit, and then Juniper came to the door and said, Wise child, do you think you could find us some firewood? Which I did. Soon the smoke was coming out of Cormac's smoke hole again, and Juniper must have been making a poultice with the oatmeal, because as I crept closer to the door again, I could hear her saying, I hope it's not too hot, but the hotter the better, really. I peeped in, and Juniper was applying the cloths to Cormac's poor face, and Cormac gave only one slight grunt as he felt the heat. That's good, said Juniper. Later on, quite a bit later, she came out to me in the garden and took me by the hand, saying, Cormac would like to speak to you. I had dreaded having to look Cormac in the face, but since she had me by the hand and I seemed to have caused so much trouble already, I did not know what else I could do but obey. She led me into the hut, and there was Cormac sitting on the chair facing the door. I looked, and looked again in astonishment. In my mind, as in my nightmares, I had always seen Cormac's two ghastly bloodshot eyes in a yellow tattered face, horribly alive, the surface of his skin crawling. I do not know whether it was because Cormac had begun to become real for me, or because of the fearlessness and infinite tenderness with which I had seen Juniper touch the living wound. But there was nothing there that frightened me now, just two sad, dark eyes, one whole cheek, most of a nose, and another cheek 
raw and whitened and pitted with holes. I looked carefully. There seemed nothing else to do. It's not as bad as I thought, I blurted out. A ghost of a smile seemed to cross Cormac's features. I'm glad, he said in his poor thickened speech. Perhaps I won't scare you so much. I'm no longer scared of you, sir, I said, and I meant it. I kept searching for whatever it was that had frightened me before. Juniper and I walked home silently. After supper, a silent supper, when we had washed the dishes, we sat in our chairs without stories or singing. Are you angry with me? I asked at last. Without speaking, Juniper held out her arms, and I climbed into her comfortable blue lap and leaned against her. I didn't know he was like that, I said at last. Philan said he had committed a terrible sin, and that was how God had punished him. Philan may hate Cormac, but I don't think God does, said Juniper. Your God loves people, doesn't he? Jesus healed the lepers. He forgave people who did wrong, even the ones who crucified him. Isn't that right? So why would he give Cormac, dear good Cormac, such a dreadful punishment? What could he possibly have done that was bad enough? Philan didn't say. I suppose he could have killed somebody, I said speculatively, or done something wicked with his body like, you know. Lots of people kill other people without getting leprosy, said Juniper, as well as hurting them in all sorts of other ways. Of course, it does sometimes make them ill in their minds, and their minds sometimes make their bodies ill, but usually we don't know why people are ill. What about your medicine? Will it make Cormac well, like the cuts on Coleman's legs? I don't know. It's more difficult. Maybe Philan's hatred makes it harder to get well. Maybe my medicine is not strong enough, but I expect it is. There was a long, easy silence between us. You know, I said at last, I thought the plants were just boring and silly, fussing around with leaves and roots and seeds. I didn't think they could really change anything. Now, it makes it worth the effort. Juniper laughed. They're part of the energy, the pattern. You'll see one day. As if the conversation had started the train of thought, I said, I saw Finbar yesterday, in my mind, you know. Yes? I told him to come back. He acted surprised, as if he had forgotten and had to be reminded. Hmm, said Juniper, sounds like Finbar.